So welcome everyone. Some house rules before the session starts. We're gonna start in exactly three minutes. So smile, you are on camera. So please know this session is being recorded. Um, we also have a camera on. So please make sure that your camera is on and we are a community. So we would like to see you. In terms of audio, please keep yourself on mute as you join. We want you to speak, but we call your name so you can unmute to participate. In terms of a profile, uh, please make sure that your name is displayed as first name, surname, and company name. To do that, you just need to click on your picture. On the right uh, hand side, you will find the three dots. You click on that and you can rename and change basically your, um, your name and surname and other company name. If you have a question, you can ask us in a Q&A. Our moderator will speak to you directly. Um, you can also use a chat to say hi and introduce yourself to everyone. And please join our community. You can find us on social media at We Ate Pink. So welcome to the second We Ate Pink webinar, Reinventing Your Career in 2020. For those of you that doesn't know We Ate Pink, We Ate Pink is a London-based community platform uh, built to promote and celebrate female leadership and gender equality in the workplace. As community focus on work and work-life balance, we felt the need to talk about the situation that a lot of us are facing at the moment. The quarantine has changed our work situation. Some of us have been furloughed or lost a job or just changed the way we work. So during this webinar, we will discuss how to embrace the liminal between a past that is gone and a future that is uncertain. The essential skills you need to expand your job prospects during and after coronavirus and the areas where you can reskill and upskill to stay in the game and keep your career going. Now we leave to Fiorenza, which is the moderator of this panel, and she will introduce the speakers and start with the webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. I love for introducing myself. My Bruce, the webinar introducing me. Uh, my name is Fiorenza. I'm the head of Creative Excellence um, at Cal Lions, the International Festival of Creativity. And I'm also the co founder of VHP uh, with Rossella. Uh, so, at the webinar, today's webinar, um, well, I, first of all, I want to introduce you our, our speakers because um, they will be the most, they will, they will be the people actually talking to you about what we are going to talk about today, which is reinventing your career in 2020. So um, actually, uh, let's see, let's, let's do something a bit different today. Let's, let's, let's ask them to introduce themselves because I don't like, I usually when we do these kind of moderations, I don't like to introduce my speakers. I want them to introduce themselves. I think it's much more interactive. But before doing that, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the reason for this webinar. I don't know if you felt like me maybe recently or in the past when you, uh, when you, you, you are in a job and you feel a little bit stuck and you're ready for a change, you're ready for a new start, and, and you, you really want to, you don't know when to, where to start from. You, you want a new career path, you know that you should make a change, but you don't know how to do it and where to start from. So I'm here today with Candace Cass, Laura Leye, and Jonathan Brown, and these guys here are real people and great professionals who have shaken up their careers despite all the usual challenges that we all go through. And they are going to discuss their experiences and they're going to share advice with you guys on how to do it, how to renovate your career, how to, how to reskill, how to start a new path. When you're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing from. If you're doing that for money, if you're doing that for more passion or for more time at home, perhaps you want a different uh, work-life balance. It doesn't matter really what you're doing that for, but you know, starting a new career, what does it mean? How do you do it? What are the tips that these three professionals can share with us today? So I really want you, know, you as well, every, every one of you joining us today, telling us about how you've done it, if you've done it, or what you would like to do, and especially what you would like to know from our speakers, because I think this, in, this is webinar that needs to, does, needs to be interactive in order for you, you are the audience, but you, know, you want to get the most out of, of, this, of this next 45 minutes with us today. So, so starting with, uh, I think, Jonathan, uh, introducing <laughs> And then put your I wondered, I thought you was going to call me out first. 
we go we go uh, and then we can move on to Laura and then and then Candace next. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. To you, please. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan Brown. Um, I'm currently a Martech um, consultant at Vodafone Group in London. Um, I've been a digital um, marketer for the last ten years or so. Um, and I've, I've worked at companies such as um, the Telegraph newspaper. Um, as well as Samsung, Microsoft, just to name some of the bigger companies I've worked for. But I've also worked for um, smaller agencies um, around London, um, Chow London, and also Reach Local. Um, I'd say that I'm a, a passionate adventurer, serial entrepreneur. Um, I'm currently a contractor due to some of my, um, my life stories that I'm going to share with, with everyone today. Um, so yeah, aside from that, like I said, I'm, I'm a keen learner. I'm keen to create as well. Um, and I'm happy to be here again. It's actually my second time with We Hate Pink. Um, um, and I love what this um, company stands for and represents. It's, it's amazing. And um, thank you everyone for attending. So I'm looking forward to giving you some, some knowledge on this session. So thank you. Moving on to Laura, I believe. I'll pass the baton to you. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> So hi everyone, my name is Laura Lelier. Um, I'm an inter intergenerational leadership coach and career coach specializing in helping millennial women. Um, my company Project Dialogue is based between the UK and France. Um, so I, I help leaders and organizations attract, motivate, manage and retain the younger generations for enhanced competitive advantage. Um, my work with millennial women as a career coach, I help them find their purpose. So I'm really excited to be here today. Um, this, is, this is exactly the subject that I love to work on um, and help them build meaningful, successful and high impact careers. Uh, as well as coaching, um, I'm also the founder of Espace Lingo. So this was my journey in France. Um, and this is a business language consultancy. And I have a team of people. We work with French companies all over the country now. I'm based in Brittany, but our clients are kind of nationwide now. Um, and we provide innovative language solutions in a wide variety of formats. So two different things, um, which, are, which is really, really cool. When I'm not working, um, I think like lots of people, I love traveling. That's one of my biggest hobbies um, in the world. And I'm also a keen musician, so I play the piano. I don't know if you can see that behind me. Um, and I also like singing. Um, so this is my first time with We Hate Pink. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and so welcome to everyone to the webinar. Thank you, Laura. Moving on to uh, Candace. Hi, everyone. I'm Candace Cust, and I'm a digital marketing consultant and an expat American that is here in London, um, where for the last 15 years, I've worked for WPP agencies, um, Helen Knowlton as their director of social media. And prior to that, I was at Ogilvy as a creative director on the interactive side. And my, my background pretty much started in traditional media. I was an art director when I got my first job but went digital quite early. And prior to coming over to the UK, I was a senior vice president at Digitas, uh, both in San Francisco and in Boston. So there has been um, such an amazing change and growth within the whole online communication world. It's been quite fascinating to be part of that. My other thing that is very much in tune with we Hate Pink is I'm on the board for the organization called Creative Equals. And I'm sure a lot of you also know them. And there's um, quite a lot of simpatico in that they seek for a true representation of diversity and inclusion within the creative industries um, across the board. So I'm thrilled to be part of this panel and I'm hoping there'll be a lot of questions as well at the end. I hope to, I hope to uh, Candace. So I think, yeah, we, we just heard from our, from our speakers, you know, this webinar really is about starting, if you want to start a new career, a new career, a new path in your, in your work, um, sort of 
in your profession, what are the steps that you're going to take when you're pondering your career change, the different generations take on the issue, and then what and where reinventing uh, your career crosses path a little bit, it crosses the line into job hopping. And we're going to um, and we're going to explain what job hopping is. I'm sure this will come up. Uh, in our in our discussion, so the first question I have for our speakers, really, which is a question that I'm sure some of you, hopefully most of you, will share with me, uh, if someone is dissatisfied, is unhappy with, with with their current job and considering making a career change, what's the first thing that you guys would recommend they do? So imagine you are in this cross this crossroad. You are dissatisfied with your current job. You want to make a change. What is the first thing that you recommend I do, we do, all of us, if we want to make a change? Um, Jonathan, what do you think? I had to think about this today, and I think that we should ask ourselves the question, is this an emotional feeling due to the workload and the project that I'm currently working on, or is this something that I've got to six months and it, the job feels monotonous? And it definitely feels like um, something that needs to happen. Um, if, if it is the latter, if it is a, a real feeling and not just an emotional moment due to the workload, then for me, that's a driver in, you know, reevaluating my time in said company. Um, but if it's just um, a moment in time where, for example, even myself, I will even say in this job, I've been put in positions where it makes me question um the job itself but i feel that again it's emotional and also sometimes i think to myself do the good outweigh the outweigh the bad if i have more pros and cons then i i feel that it's just an emotional moment in time in a said project um working with particular people because we all have people in our jobs that we don't always get on with you know um but again if it is if the cons outweigh the pros then Again, is, it, is the, the people you work with are not, you're not a good fit in the business, as you can tell, you'll know within yourself if you're a good fit or not. Um, is the commute too long? Is it cost effective? Like all of these things come into play after being in a business um, for a particular amount of time. And also, is it ticking that own, is, so your boxes regard to, um, to learning and aspiring and meeting your goals, you know? Um, are they doing what you really want to do? Are they supporting you in the areas you want to grow in? So, so those are the things that I actually come up with regard to um, dissatisfaction in a job role. I think that's really smart, the, the notion that trying to separate out the emotional uh, from the rational, because I think people need to be passionate about what they do, but in terms of career planning or um, having a goal for how you want to progress, that needs that rational side. I, um, I've seen a lot of stats that say people don't leave jobs, they actually leave bosses. Exactly. It's uh, often that, you know, you're, you're going, this just isn't a good fit for me because that person is not a good fit for me. But stepping away from it is a good thing to do and mapping out, um, as, as Jonathan was saying, is it part of your goals? Are you getting... Um, are you in the right industry? Because it might be that that, if the if the tasks that you do every day are not bringing you happiness, it might be that it's the wrong um, kind of profession or industry. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I think to add to that, um, I was also thinking about this today. Um, to to have that objectivity, which is sometimes really really difficult when you're in that job that you're finding difficult for for many different reasons is just simply to, to take a journal, take five minutes at the end of every day and say, you know, what did I enjoy today? What was the source of my dissatisfaction today? And over time, you know, you can then look at that in a really objective way and then assess, you know, what is the right direction um, for me? Is it leaving or, or am I just getting flustered from, from daily things or relationships with people I may not get on with? So I think that, that that's a good thing to do to kind of ensure objectivity as well. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you about, I, I agree with the journal. I think I actually done it before and, and it works, especially to, 
really to pinpoint what's what's wrong because sometimes you know you're not you're dissatisfied, dissatisfied with some aspects of your job but not necessarily the entire thing so you want to kind of really understand what is actually that you are uh, discontent with let's talk about next step in that sense so imagine i'm that kind of person that you know want to make a change want to kind of start a new career and i you know i, I start looking around and and so the question that i think came up a little bit in some some discussions also i had with with colleagues and friends is that what do you what do you actually do you do you jump do you jump into something new? You know, there are some people that say, okay, I want to change career, so I'm just gonna, the next job I'm gonna, I gonna find, I'm just gonna get into something new, something different and, and start again. Or you just need to, you know, pondering a little bit your choices, what you got in front of you. So how, how is that kind of, you know, the, the limbo, I call it, I guess, you know, between the current job and then what you're gonna be doing next. That limbo, how do you think you, you should best utilize that time that, that you, when the, from the moment you start thinking about changing career? Um, John, what do you think? Um, so I, I would relate the limbo to two things. Being in a job and knowing you want to change or being, let's say, made redundant and being pushed out of a business because I've been in both positions where I've actually been within a job, I've been on notice, I've had time to go and find myself a job and it's a smooth transition because it's not disruptive to your lifestyle, your bills that we all have to pay and things like that. Whereas when you are pushed out of a business, either through redundancies or other factors, um, you feel a little bit of pressure, a bit of anxiety with it as well. And you feel like I really need to get a job because I don't have a job. I don't know. Um, obviously, there's different variations to this regarding savings that we all have and external pressures and responsibilities that we all have. Um, so that's so that's one so one aspect of finding a new role. Um, secondly, I think the opportunity that presents itself, um, I think that that lies with us. For example. Um, how do we embrace the change? What's the perspective of the change? Like to your point, um, Ferenza, when you were saying, you know, um, the opportunity for to, the opportunity to have a new job, um, it's a, like it's a window of opportunity, but it all depends on us and how we perceive that, you know. Um, so I'm I'm an advocate of, you know, embracing the change um, and the window of opportunity, and also. If I've been a graphics designer for, let's say, the last three years, what if I then want to move into copywriting? Is this something that I, I want to invest in and blossom and grow in another area and, and add another string to my bow? Or am I going to stay in my comfort lane because it's probably going to be easier and quicker to find a job of a similar ilk? So again, it depends on the kind of person we are and the point of our career and whether we want to have a career change or just stay in the same zone. I said a bit, a lot there, but um, that's, uh, I hope you all can understand what I'm getting at there. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, can that, about that. Um, I think that is um, very pivotal, that point of, is it an actual career change or just a job change? Um, are you seeking something very similar or maybe a step up, a step up that particular career ladder or career tree, um, or is it a different aspect? I think that the um, individual circumstances are so important, but the, the way to sometimes expand your repertoire is to branch out while you're still in the current role and to do some aspects of it that might be in addition, but do, as Jonathan said, add, add more strings to your bow. So have, um, I had um, been working on some podcasts with some of the people at my last agency who were very new to it. But the wonderful thing about some of these formats is once you are hands-on with it, you gain an awful lot of information and they can be new aspects of what you might be counseling clients about. So, I would always seek to kind of think about yourself as others see you, which is really one of the hardest things in the world. But how, how are the attributes and the skills that you have apparent 
to both your colleagues now and potential clients or employers in the future? That's, that's a very good point, Candace. See, uh, you know, how to kind of, you know, the, the perception that, the perception that others have of you, uh, also that that's kind of important at the end of the day because, you know, what, what is your role in the ecosystem, in the company you work for, not just your role in terms of your job, but what, what kind of your presence, how people, you know, it's, it's, it's also about that kind of the persona and not just about technical or, or professional skills. Yeah. I know we're going to talk about this further, but the whole notion of the brand called you, which is very, very real and is not like a bad thing or an ego thing. It's quite actually a healthy thing. Making sure you kind of are known and stand out, especially for things that are holes in the marketplace or maybe less common. So for example, um, I know some women who are really, really uh, into sports and they're quite expert in sports. So in terms of sports marketing, it's quite male skewed, but they have that, that natural passion. So if they are um, seen as part as that ecosystem, they're adding something that people can turn to them and go, oh, you're an expert in this. Let me ask your opinion. Yeah, Laura, what, would you, what, is, your, what is your view on this? Yeah, I think um, it's, really with think things have changed so much in the past six months and they're going to continue changing and I think you know the people who will be the most employable in the future are people who have have engaged in this idea of commitment to a lifelong learning um, and I think if your company your current company can offer you those different possibilities that is the best that's that's absolutely incredible. Um, often it's it's not the case, unfortunately. And so what I would say to to counteract that is that a lot of us, not everybody, but a lot of us have more time on our hands right now. And so use this time um, in a productive way to maybe pursue a side project. And this can be have nothing to do with what you do right now. Um, if you're in marketing, it could be I don't know. I've got a friend who started to make soaps, for example, and it's absolutely not connected to to her main um, business. This, but she, she's learning so many new skills in doing this. Um, so I'd say kind of commitment to lifelong learning, have, having this open mind, because all we can control is, is the way we react to the crisis, not the actual crisis. Um, and I think that's, that's key moving forward. People who show they're flexible, agile, people who are committed to upskilling um, will be the, the employees who will be the most coveted in the future in, in all type of industries. And actually talking about upskilling or reskilling, uh, that's, that's, there is a question already coming through, so that's, that's great. Um, the question is how important is upskilling really? And is that just a paper with your name of it on it, you know, just a certificate or, you know, something that, like a, a course that you've done and you put that in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in your drawer, another paper with your name on it, or does it really have purpose? So how important is upskilling? Jonathan, what do you think? I think upskilling is very important. Um, I, can't, I can't stress how important continual education is for all of us. Um, you know, I've worked as a project manager at Microsoft. I've worked in digital insights. Um, I'm lucky to, to manage several businesses on my own back, but I don't have to call on other people to look at digital data and foster insights from the data that my other um, businesses are generating, for example. Um, or I may have to support another fellow entrepreneur that I have in, in different areas of their business. But the fact of this, um, the point of what I'm saying is, the more you know, the more powerful you are and the less you have to rely on other people. Um, and when we're talking about employability, Again, the more you know within a role or even outside of a role, that's only going to benefit all of us when that time comes in a more, let's say, professional setting. Um, you may be um, a website content manager, but you might be working on a side project doing social media for a friend. That, that knowledge you're going, you're going to um, garner doing that is going to be priceless. And you can, you can then go into your day job and support that business in that area and who knows down the line that may lead to um, managing or being a part of the social media function within the business for example 
Um, so I am a massive um, advocate of continual learning because um, it's only going to be of benefit. The people that don't learn are the people that often get found um, in problems, in, whether it's today or five, six, seven, eight years down the line. It's always important to upskill. Um, and with that, with that being said, um, you choose what you want to learn as well. So no one tells you what to learn. It's like a passion project. You know, if one, I think we've all had this moment of, especially during COVID, um, of I'm going to learn a language or I'm going to maybe start trying to understand what that C++ programming language is or I've always wanted to do poetry. It doesn't matter, but do something. It's only going to help. You know, whatever it is, upskilling is the way forward. And I, I think the, the points about digital are really good as we are all experiencing our entire lives being <laughs> focused around the internet because some um, advice I might, might share is something I try to do, which is understand all the tools that we have to use. So it's not just that we must use Zoom or whether it's Teams, whatever, whatever you're using for your own jobs. How do these systems work? What are the other alternates? What about um, some more advanced video conferencing software? Should you try something like Shindig or you should try maybe with your friends you're using Hangout or something? I think it's really important not to, not to let the tools run you, but to have um, sort of a deeper understanding and knowledge like the little functionality, like the three dots, press on that and you can change your name, you can change um, the, the screen rotation, whatever it is, like have more of a power user uh, focus on the tools we have to use every day. It's, it's like people who know how to change the oil of their cars are better, <laughs> are better placed than just those of us that just drive them and have no idea how the engine works. Because um, it's so vital. It's so vital for modern modern work going forward. This is not going away. Never. Definitely not. Uh, Laura, what do you think about the upskilling sort of subject? Totally, totally agree. It's, again, you know what I was saying before, this commitment to, to lifetime learning. Um, and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, it could be, yeah, learning a language. It could be learning how to, you know, taking a course in digital marketing or, or whatever it is, whatever you're interested in. I think that's really important. I think, you know, technology is so, so important, but also so are things like creativity. Um, this is a big one for, for companies now kind of adapting always creating, always looking for new solutions, um, emotional intelligence as well, leadership skills are becoming more and more and more important. So whatever you're interested in, um, just, just pursue it. And I, I think the good news is, is that it's never been easier to upskill as well. Um, we have so much, so many resources online, um, so many you know, websites that you can go on, you don't have to spend a fortune and you certainly don't have to, to get a degree um, at a university in order to upskill in a particular area. So I think that's really encouraging um, that it's open to everybody. You just have to choose what you have, you just have to find what you really love to do and what you want to learn. I think passion is key. Yeah, absolutely. Anything you want to do, otherwise why would you even start making a change, right? Uh, I think we've got a question from, from the audience, another one. Saba, do you, do you have the question there? We have one audience member asking what your top tips for transferable skills for the entire panel. What are your top tips for uh, how to use? I guess the question perhaps is about is around how to, you know, so you've got transferable, we all do, I, I guess. But how do you best use them when, when you want to change role, maybe change career? So what are your top tips? So many different skills in the world. I think there's some, though, that are really key in a wide variety of roles, uh, one of which would be writing, clear writing, um, very straightforward writing, trying to avoid the PowerPoint words and the gobbledygook many of us have been um, guilty of in the past. So no matter what it is you do for a living, if you can demonstrate that you are quite good at the written word, that's a benefit that could be used and transferred to a wide variety of roles. And you might, so how to demonstrate that, if you don't have a blog, you should have a blog, or if you already have a blog, you could have a podcast, like have some evidence. I think everyone, not just creatives, should have some kind of portfolio 
meaning things that they could point to, and whether it's work with your school and your kids or a charity, like something beyond just your work resume. And that helps people see you, the full you, the, the different skills that you have are, um, you can link to them. You know, we all need evidence, we need receipts, we need something that, that says, oh yes, you are indeed really good at this thing. And I agree, it's not just about work skills, but you know, something like you work with a charity, you work for a, like a passion project, even, even things that are not related, not, not, definitely not related to your, to your everyday job. I think that's, that's useful to, to have the, for an employer to have the, the full picture of who you are and what you, can, uh, what you can be, basically, to the company, to the team, right? So, John, what do you think about that? I mean, it's a really good question, firstly. Um... Transferable skills. So I've got, again, I've got like a double-edged sword or maybe two sides of a coin. I think that's a better term than a double-edged sword. Um, basically, I think that one, one of the main things for transferable skills would be, for me personally, be, personally would be be human first. I feel that, you know, if you're likable, if you understand who you are and you're comfortable with who you are, I think that's going to resonate with the audience wherever you go whoever you're these people are you're going to meet um if you know how to communicate clearly if you if you deliver the work on time it will then affect your reputation which will then leave a positive like you know um memory of yourself with said person um so i think that's a massive thing for me you know people skills understanding who you're talking to being respectful maintaining a high level of integrity all of these things that aren't spoken about, but are transferable from person to person. Um, so that's my thing, be human first. Secondly, when we talk about the skills that we learn, I think the opportunities will present themselves with time. So we, we, we will learn skills along the road, along the way, in job to job, um, working with person to person, on project to project. As we move through our careers, will we'll then realize, actually, I did this in my, my previous roles or in my first job, I actually did this and I haven't touched upon this for the last four years. However, the skill stays with us. So what we learn will then, you know, blossom and hopefully become fruitful in our futures. So um, those are the two aspects for myself, being human first and not trying to overthink these transferable skills. What we know is with us what we do going forward will then allow us to lean on the skills we learned before. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, and Laura, do you have uh, anything to add? I do, yeah. Um, I'd say self-awareness is one of the most important skills that can be transferred, whatever job you do, whatever industry you work in. So the ability to see yourself clearly, but also the ability to understand how you are seen by other people. Um, I think that it's, I guess, your first point, Jonathan, about this thing about being human, first of all, um, self-awareness is, is very connected to that. So how do you do that um, to, you know, I, I think take some time to get introspective with yourself, um, ask yourself, what, are, what is my purpose? What are my passions? What are my aspirations? What types of environment do I thrive in? Um, and how do I want to project myself? And I think as the world becomes um, more international, more diverse, this is just going to become more and more important. Um, so self-awareness is, is a big one, I think. Um, and the second one I think is absolutely crucial, what I touched on a little bit before, is this idea of, of being agile and being flexible. Um, I think, you know, the job, the concept of a job for life is, is probably going to disappear very, very soon. So I think to stay in the game, it's just accepting this constant evolution, this constant movement um, in this kind of willingness to be flexible um, and to, to adapt to all types of situations. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for this, um, for this, um, for adding this. So we have, I think, another question from the audience. I think, Saba, you got that from someone. Yes. So um, we've got a, a question specifically for Candice. 
Um, our audience wants to know if you have any recommendations for digital marketing courses that have some credibility. Actually, I know of one definitely because I'm participating. The PRCA, which is the public relations trade body that does uh, quite a lot of events and different programs. There is a digital marketing course that they run. There's four different instructors um, on one of them. And the next one is the last is the last week of July, but they run it, I think, quarterly. Um, and then they have some other courses as well. But I also would recommend, I think what used to be lynda.com was bought by LinkedIn and it's called LinkedIn Learning. They have a huge array of courses in many different things, but some of them are very specific digital marketing. And I would definitely check that out because it also is um, chunked. So you could do one that's just about search engine optimization, you know, one that's just about email marketing because there's, it's so vast the world of digital that it's sometimes quite good to maybe do an intro, but then a deeper dive into the parts of it that interest you most. So and can I just um, add to that, Candice, as well, just on this subject, because I'm, I'm currently um, a, market, a marketing manager as well, um, and I think, or marketing technology manager, and something that works with me is being future facing. So um, I believe the future of marketing right now, or, or MarTech, a marketing technology would be um, digital personalization, um, um, like customer data platforms. We're now moving away from data management platforms. Um, and then we've also got, we're now moving into a world where we have a multitude of soft, software companies. I'm just going to name two. We've got Adobe and we've also got another called Salesforce, um, which have a repertoire of products within their own ecosystems. And what we're now moving into is a world of big enterprise businesses saying, I'm going to be a Google vendor or I'm going to be an Adobe vendor, or I'm going to be a Salesforce um, vendor, or I should say customer, sorry. Um, with that being said, like I said, all of those companies have their own individual MarTech tools within their own suites. And that's where those big businesses are looking for specialists on those particular um, sets of softwares within their businesses. So um, I would consider you know, researching Adobe products, um, Adobe marketing products, um, researching Salesforce products and also researching Google products as well because they are the main three players in the marketing um, world. Obviously you have the super users who will then um, use the products but behind that in the engine room you have let's say people like myself um, and some of the more um, specialized um, individuals who will be um, you know driving the business in that sort of way so I would also recommend looking into those sort of areas as well. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, something else we would like, I would like to get your opinion about um, is, is actually job hopping. I think I've been, I've been asked this question a few times, even myself when, you know, speaking, talking with colleagues about, you know, when you get CVs in front of you and you, you get, you know, someone with, let's say, um, 20 different work experiences in the last, uh, couple of years and someone else with like one or two. So this kind of attitude that apparently is really common with young workers between the age of 20 and 25. So going from one job to the other, really job hopping, that's what it's called. So do you think that's something that, you know, as an employer, if you haven't been on that side or on the other side, do you think that's something that, you know, would you, Something would you do? Have you done that in your in, in your in, in the past? Is something that as an employer you think that's a little bit too much? Why this person changed jobs constantly? Was perhaps you know not not happy with what he was doing or she was doing? And 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 then this is regarded a little bit as, as a negative, um, a negative thing on your CV. Well, what is your view on this, uh, Candace, for example? Um, I think that job hopping is a negative thing if it's chronic um, and it's negative from the view of most hiring managers from HR departments or the person that's looking because the thing that it took me a really long time to actually re realize this people hire based on 
the fact that they have an issue or a problem or a hole in their team and they're looking for a solution. They're looking for someone to take that and take a one load off of their back, meaning a person I can trust who will who'll come to this job, do, do wonderful work, and they want that person hopefully to stick around for a while. So too much job hopping is not gonna look good from the eyes of the person that's, that's hiring. I think it's more easily understood or maybe forgiven for entry level people or more junior people where you have, um, it maybe makes more sense to have a bit of a, a look-see, a look around. I think for more senior people, if there's enough time, so it's not hopping so much as career progression. So it's not every year, but there's nothing wrong with every three or four because in many organizations, the best way to actually get a solid promotion or a good raise is to go to a new company. That's a sad, that's a sad truth of organizational life. Um, I also think, and, and again, I think Laura had mentioned earlier that the workplace is, there is no job forever. I think the concept of loyalty from the employer or the company standpoint is, is old and dusty and doesn't exist. Companies do not have loyalty. However, there's still loyalty between people. So the, the idea that you have wonderful relationships, hopefully with some of the people you work with and might be loyal to your team, loyal to a particular leader, that can last beyond individual companies. And so I think that's something where we can go, I, I wanna increase my loyalty with the people and, and it maybe doesn't matter so much between corporations. Yes, um, that's, that's a good point. Loyalty, I think, is, 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 is very important. And also, I think it depends uh, what kind of stage of, of, of your career you are, because when selecting CVs myself, for example, I've been facing you know, people that is very different if you're in your early 20s versus like in your 40s, really. And you know, that, that there is a big difference when you are, you are actually hungry for experience. So you just go from one job to the other. And then when you settle down, settle down a little bit more in your career, then perhaps it's become a bit less uh, frantic. Uh, what do you think, Jonathan, about this? Um, I was actually thinking, I, f I, f I find this conversation quite fascinating because if I meet someone for the first time and we start talking about travel and they say to me, I've traveled across 10 countries over the last year. Um, it's like a wow factor. It's like, that's amazing. But when you talk to someone about um, working, it's like frowned upon. And I don't feel that, that we should really like the world's changed. Firstly, for me personally, I feel I am a person who has job, ho job hopped a lot you know if i if i uploaded my cv on the screen right now you'd see like a vast array of different um different job roles in different businesses for different durations of times due to different life circumstances and the way that life presented itself i don't really feel that we need to be in a job for four or five years i find it monotonous and tiring if i'm being totally honest but i do find i do actually I, I get quite excited by new, new challenges. And there's nothing worse than having someone sat in a business after four years and they're lifeless and they're just doing the same thing. Um, they go into their shell, they're comfortable. I've been to companies where I've gone in like really enthusiastic and my boss has said, go and meet like Paul who works in the analytics team. And me having that analytics experience, even though I'm not an analytics specialist, but I'm just going to talk about the analytics role in the, in the business. And he's just got no energy. He's just like, yeah, you know, I have chased this project and that, but you know, no one's really wanted to do it. So I've just backed down and I'm like, come on, man, like let's do this work. Let's, let's drive the change in the business. Um, but I just find people that are in businesses for too long are just very comfortable and not driven. So if you ask me if I've hired, in fact, I have hired someone who had a wealth of experience versus someone who, who had been in the company for four, five years. And that's the same. You look at their CV and it's like, I've spent six years here. I spent four or five years here. 
I'm like, okay, so how are you going to deal with change in such a dynamic environment if you're so used to something being the same for such a long duration of time? I need someone who can adapt quickly and will be comfortable with adapting quickly and can make decisions quickly. Um, so again, I digressed a little bit, but um, yeah, I feel that change is good. And like I've said to you before, Florenza, I said it at the last We Hate Pink event, embrace change because change is constant. Um, and look at where we are, like COVID times. This is another change. And what did that do? That made us all have to work from home and indoors. Unfortunately, some people are going to lose their roles. Constant change. Change is a constant. So sitting on your, your laurels and being in that comfortable state, for me, isn't the way to be. Always be up for change. Always be on your toes. Always look, look for new opportunities. Be open to learn and, and, you know, blossom and do amazing things. But change is the only way that's going to happen, I feel. So that's my answer on that. Okay, so we got something, actually, a comment on, on, your, on, your, on your answer, John, here. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan. I have career hopes and I think I finally know where I want to be. It's hard persuading employers that was from wanting to get lots of experience and try new things rather than just flaky. So. Thumbs up. <laughs> Um, Laura, what, what, what is your take on this from your perspective, you know, as a, you know, working out obviously with, with people, young, young generation looking for work, what, what, what do you think? What, what yeah. is your experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a job hopper myself. My husband is a job hopper, you know, we're around the same age, we're, we're millennials. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that, you know, that concept is, is probably pretty outdated. Um, I think is what Jonathan was saying, somebody who has job topped maybe if it's not like every six months or every year and um, if it's not too much i think when you job pop and when you try different companies you're mixing with different people um you're maybe working in different industries you're learning new skills you're learning um to adapt quickly to learn quickly and to evolve so i think that's really really important um research has shown as well that people who job hop generally um are promoted faster they, um, in general, are more successful in their field. So I think there's a lot of positive things. I think what we need, maybe need to address um, is that organizations haven't quite grasped that, certainly for, for millennials, um, for that perspective, it's not all about money. Um, this idea of purpose and meaning is actually more important um, than, than just about bringing a paycheck home. So and I think they haven't aligned to that fast enough yet. And I think... Um, you know, a lot of organizations have some work to do by seeing that differently. Um, yeah, and seeing the benefits of job hopping rather than saying, oh, um, I'm going to question their loyalty. I think often people leave companies because their skills aren't being utilized enough or because there aren't enough learning and development opportunities. Not all the time, but definitely sometimes. And I think that's something to consider. One last um, question, and I think it's very important that we ask this question because we got, we got um, different people from the audience actually asking this, and it's about uh, personal branding. Um, so what, what, how, do you, how do you do personal branding effectively, especially when you're looking for a new job? Um, uh, starting with, um, uh, with Candace, please. I think it's a really great question. I think it's something everyone should think about. I would say to you, go Google yourself. Um, it's not an ego thing because you just want to see what actually comes up. And just like if you were going for a job interview, you would Google the uh, person you're going to meet or the people, the team you're going to meet. If they're smart, they're doing the same thing. So that's where things like LinkedIn really come to the foreground in that it doesn't, and it doesn't even have to be just when you're looking for a job, but making sure that the full true professional you is illustrated in the material that's on there. So not just your CV and this job and that job, but list out your skills, list out organizations you're part of, uh, training you've had. It's a great place to put in your own links to um, things that matter to you that you've been involved with. And I would also say the, the thing, there's so many different social platforms. Have a think about your own job and the kind of work that you do and that you wanna do, and then say, which of these are the best places for the professional to communicate? 
and which might be more private. So I have Instagram and I know everybody loves Instagram. My personal Instagram is private. If I was still an art director, like when I started, I would have another account that's a public account where I would be sharing my visual aesthetic. I would be commenting on different um, creative award winners, things that have to do with that kind of profession. So have a really clear idea in your own head, which are the parts of the, of the professional you that you wanna make apparent um, and if there's other things that are just the full you, do they need to be public or should they be private? It all depends on your own circumstance and, and the kind of industry or the kind of job that you're interested in. I made great, great tips. But Google yourself, that's... <laughs> and I made a great you see. <laughs> and Jonathan, what do you think? Um... How did you do your personal branding? So yeah, um, this is an interesting one because I've gone from having an old Instagram account to deleting it because I was just like, I'm done with Instagram to creating a new one for more professional to Candice's point. Um, I think, okay, let me, let me start again. So for me, I will say I've got a few ideas for everyone. Um, I think, you know, it's all about posting. So let's say, you know, um, you've met a recruiter, um, they forwarded on your details to a um, um, head of department and they're looking at, you know, they said, look at your LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn like every day. Like I love LinkedIn. That is my channel. Um, but what I'm finding in this moment in time is that people are not posting professionally and people are posting emotionally on a, on a platform that's meant to be a professional setting. So my first bit of advice would be, don't post emotionally to a degree. Obviously, we've had a lot that's happened in the last, you know, six, seven weeks, as we all know. I'm not going to go into all that, but a lot's happened, basically. So understanding the current climate on the platform and the current conversation is fine to participate. But I just feel like we're in a stage now where people are talking about things on platforms that aren't actually relevant to, to um, let's say, boosting your job search. Um, but I would say if you are going to post, be confident in what you post and make sure it's got enough substance and also don't post every day. Like you don't have to post every day be just because you're searching for a job, you know, you don't have to overly sell yourself, you know. Um, and lastly, regarding personal branding, again, it's something that I don't really see a lot of people talking about, but I would end it. My personal ending would be live your truth. Okay. So don't try and portray yourself as something you're not. Um, you know, don't doubt what you are going to say. You know, just be comfortable in what you, you do. So, for example, I use myself. Um, I started lecturing in universities and colleges, um, doing keynote speeches for young people. But I used to think to myself, I shouldn't post any of this on my LinkedIn because it could conflict with my contractual work that I do with Vodafone. But then I thought, what have I got to hide? You know, this is what I do. This is my truth. Like if someone questions it, I'm confident in it. It's not, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm saying, yeah, I go to universities. I lecture young people. I did a lecture on digital personalization for young people, you know? Um, and after I started to share what I was doing with other people in work, a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm seeing what you're doing on LinkedIn, Jonathan. That's amazing. I wish I could do that. Let's have a coffee. Let's talk about it. They want to know, but that's only through, me being confident enough in myself to say, no, I'm going to share this with people. It's a bit different, but I'm confident about what I'm doing and I'm confident that this is going to generate positive change or I'm confident to share this with people. So, so lastly, that's it. Live your truth, everyone. I think that's something that, you know, if you do that, you'll be able to sleep well at night, sleep with a smile on your face, walk down the street confidently, and most importantly, sit in front of employers, um, that are looking for people um, with your sort of skill sets and stuff. Um, and you'll be able to hold your head up high in front of hiring managers. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing, the thing that I always tell the, the women I work with is just be yourself. Um, maybe don't think about it too, too much or too hard. Um, everybody is unique, you know, 
brainstorm what issues do you really care about yeah don't, don't hesitate to post about what you really care about um you are unique the companies that you're are going to be interviewing you they're not looking for a robot who's just kind of churning out the same thing um they're looking for a person and so i think if you convey that on your social channels that is your personal brand and just be consistent um with what you post about and, and be yourself that's it Thank you, Laura, and thank you to our speakers, really, to, 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 for being with us today and sh for sharing their thoughts and, uh, and views on, on a subject that is really, uh, I guess, wider than, than what we think. And obviously, we cannot ask, answer all the question and touch on all, all, the, all, the, all the different um, nuances of, of this subject in, in, in half an hour, 40, 40 minutes. But we got, I got some notes here that I would, I would like to share with, with you guys. Um, so, like in terms of job hopping, you know, kind of different opinions there. But um, but you know, it's not a bad thing. I guess I think personally, uh, it depends on where, what stage of your career you do it, and 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 definitely definitely about you know changing your career, making making uh, choices that um, will lead to a change. Don't forget to think about what you want to do next while you're still in your current job. So take a journal perhaps um, as, as Laura said um, to pinpoint what are actually the reasons why you want to change your your career why you want to change your role why you're looking for something new and then also something important I think that I'm sharing with you because I believe that it's really important is expanding I think I think Kanda said that expanding your repertoire while you are in your current job so go and take classes courses passion projects anything you think that is gonna actually give you those tools and 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 uh, and uh, those skills that you will need for for your next uh, step uh, in your career so just do that while you're still in your current job and expand your skills uh, and also don't forget how others perceive you and that leads to personal branding because obviously, uh, you know, Google yourself, as Kanda said, uh, how people show, how, how do you show publicly on social media? on Google even. Um, I, sh I think I will, I will do that after this. I, I haven't checked my <laughs> mine in a while. Uh, and also think about your private account versus, versus public account. Perhaps have two accounts. If you want to use one you know, for personal reason, maybe don't mix the two things together. Perhaps it's not a good idea to do that. And also, um, I think something that Jonathan said that was really interesting, you know, we live in a, in a time of obviously everybody's Kind of emotional talking about you know what's happening in the world and we're not gonna we're not gonna get into that discussion now but you know people are posting emotionally on professional pla on professional platforms such as uh, linkedin and twitter is that correct do, do we need to do that do we do that how do we do that perhaps you know trying to kind of really think a little bit more about you know do i want to post something that is private to me on LinkedIn or I we reserve that to my private Facebook or or or, or Instagram account. So we need to think about that and um, and you know it really perhaps you know separate a little bit the rational from 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 the emotional uh, side of things. Um, I think I think it's that's all from my side uh, and I hope you guys enjoy this 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 webinar this exchange of, of thoughts and opinion around career change and um, I think I, I want to ask Rosella to say a couple of, of words to, to, to close off to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for um taking part of this webinar. I thank you for everyone. Thank you to the speaker and to Fiorenz and Saba for doing an amazing job on this webinar. We will keep doing um, other webinar, probably starting from September again. So we'll, I suggest to keep following us on social. We are as, as we at Pink, you can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening.